Hey everyone, my name is Brady Witten, and this is The Word Meets the World for January 13th, 2022. So January 6th was the one year anniversary of a mob of extremist Trump supporters storming the US Capitol in an attempt to disrupt the certification of the election of Joe Biden as president. One of the many troubling aspects of this incident was that some members of the mob carried signs, flags, and wore clothing that featured Christian slogans and symbols. So was the storming of the U.S. Capitol a political act, or was it, as some suggest, fueled by a dangerous mixture of politics and religion known as Christian nationalism? What even is Christian nationalism, and what does the Bible have to say about it? That's our topic for this week's The Word Meets the World. So what is Christian nationalism and what does the Bible say about it? Historically, the words patriotism and nationalism have a similar meaning, but over time their meanings have diverged. Patriotism is a word that means devoted love, support, and defense of one's country. We would say a person who serves their country or in the military or some other form of civil service is showing patriotism. The word nationalism is a little more difficult to define. Nationalism often has to do with asserting the interests of one's own nation above the common interests of humanity. It often has to do with preserving some aspect of personal identity like religion or race. And nationalism often insists that a particular and often exclusive ideology is the only right way to define a nation. So the Nazis were nationalists. They believed that the nation of Germany should be defined by the race of its citizen, so-called Aryans. And that was at the exclusion of all other people. In this case, their racial ideology and their national identity became one and the same. Uh, Muslim extremist groups are also often nationalists. The Taliban, who recently took control in Pakistan, weave their Islamic beliefs and their national identity seamlessly. Anyone who disagrees with them is a threat not only to their faith, but to their nation. In an article in Christianity Today, Paul Miller defines Christian nationalism as the belief that the American nation is defined by Christianity and that the government should take active steps to keep it that way. So there are multiple problems with Christian nationalism. First, although many of our nation's founders did claim the Christian faith, they also put a set of laws in place, the First Amendment, that guarantee religious freedom. Congress shall not make a law respecting an establishment of religion, the Constitution says. Second, there's a great danger when aggressively insisting that my religious value system is the only value system, that I will become the very kind of person that my religious values don't, don't want me to become. So C.S. Lewis says, the sins of the flesh are bad, but they are the least bad of all the sins. All the worst pleasures are purely spiritual. The pleasure of putting other people in the wrong, of bossing and patronizing and spoiling sport and backbiting, and the pleasure of power and hatred. That's why a cold, self-righteous prig who goes regularly to church may be far nearer to hell than a prostitute. But of course, Lewis says, it's better to be neither. But what we're here to explore is what the Bible has to say about this topic. So let's get to it. The first thing worth noting is that the Bible indicates that God gave humanity government for our good. Uh, in the book of Romans, in the 13th chapter, uh, the very first verse, Paul says this, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those authorities that exist have been instituted by God. Uh, the Bible also shows where God uses nations to accomplish God's purposes. In uh, the prophet Isaiah, in the 45th chapter, the 13th verse, Isaiah says this, I have aroused Cyrus in righteousness, and I will make all his paths straight. He shall build my city and set my exiles free, not for price or reward, says the Lord of hosts. Now Cyrus was the king of Persia, and he defeated the Babylonians who were responsible for the destruction of Jerusalem in 587 BCE. 
Cyrus not only allowed the people of Israel to re-inhabit and rebuild Jerusalem, he also gave them financial and political support to do so. So does this mean that every government and every leader is an agent of God? Uh, one of the most fascinating things about the Apostle Paul's statement in Romans 13 is that the emperor of Rome at the time he wrote it was a guy named Nero. Now Nero is considered one of the greatest criminals in all of human history. Among other things, he killed his own mother to consolidate his power. So was Paul suggesting that Nero was put in power by God? I don't think so. I think what Paul is saying is that governance itself is good. The exercise of authority is good. People organizing themselves for mutual benefit is good. Common laws and rules are good. And leadership is good. But is every leader an agent of God? No. See, humans still have free will. And like every good gift from God, people can and do twist government and leadership into something destructive. So governance is a moral good, but specific people and specific governments may not be. So the Bible also reminds us that compared to God's power and might, kings and nations are nothing. Again, uh, we turn to the prophet Isaiah in the 40th chapter. He writes this. This is verse 21. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretched out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to live in, who brings princes to naught and makes the rulers of the earth as nothing. This is why the Bible tells us that the only king and kingdom that ultimately matter is the kingdom of God. So Jesus himself says, my kingdom is not of this world. Paul tells us that as Jesus' followers that our citizenship is in heaven. And the Bible makes it clear that the kingdom of heaven is greater than any one nation or people. On the day of Pentecost, when God poured his Holy Spirit out upon the disciples, people from every nation heard the disciples proclaiming the gospel in their native tongue. The book of Revelation imagines God's kingdom as a place full of people from every nation, from all tribes and people and languages. And this is perhaps the greatest problem that I see with Christian nationalism. As Christians, our first and our greatest loyalty is not to some worldly government or person. Our greatest loyalty is to Jesus and to God's kingdom. And we must take care not to confuse sort of our, earth, our, our eternal identity with our earthly identity. I often say to people, if, if you're going to ask me to define myself, I say, I am a child of God and a citizen of heaven first. Uh, I would add that I'm a human being second, and I'm an American third. And if I'm completely honest, I'm a left-leaning independent fourth. Uh, now, this doesn't mean that we don't participate in the processes of government. We do. The Bible teaches us to be good citizens. It doesn't mean our faith in Jesus doesn't inform our political loyalties or, or decisions. It will and it should. It doesn't mean we can't talk about political things from a spiritual perspective. We must. But we must be careful not to let our faith and our political ideology get too comfortable with one another. Our faith in Jesus and our citizenship in heaven must stand above and remain distinctive from every other identity. Pope Francis recently said that politics is the most important of civil activities and has its own field of action, which is not that of religion. They're, they're distinct. <laughs> I like Tony Campolo's metaphor about what happens when we let politics and religion get too close. He says, mixing politics and religion is like mixing ice cream and manure. It doesn't affect the manure much, but it really messes up the ice cream. Uh, I'll let you decide which is the manure and which is the ice cream in that metaphor. So I want to be clear about something. I love Jesus and I love America in that order. Uh, and they are two distinct loves. I certainly don't think that America needs to be in the Jesus business. So I want to leave you with the words of a hymn I love. It's, uh, this is my song, and it's in the United Methodist hymnal. 
Every time Christians sing God Bless America in worship, I really believe it should be followed by this song. This is my song, O God of all the nations, a song of peace for lands afar and mine. This is my home, the country where my heart is. Here are my hopes, my dreams, my holy shrine. But other hearts in other lands are beating with hopes and dreams as true and high as mine. My country's skies are bluer than the ocean and sunlight beams on clover leaf and pine. But other lands have sunlight too and clover and skies are everywhere as blue as mine. Oh, hear my song, O God of all the nations, a song of peace for their land and for mine. So what do you think about all this? Uh, I want to leave you with some questions to guide your thinking or maybe a discussion uh, if you're part of a group. Uh, but before I put those questions up, I do want to ask you to like and to share this video uh, and to like, subscribe, and follow First Methodist on whatever platform you're viewing this on. See you next time, everyone.